You look beautiful up there. Thanks. You do. Absolutely gorgeous. I love the outfit, top to bottom. Thanks, I didn't pick it out. It's, you know what? There's only so much you can be good at. Yeah. You get me? I'm good at very few things. I, what are you talking about? I mean, what are you good at? Uh, me? <laughs> I don't... I f- G- oh, good question. No, not in like a douchey oh, way. But no, but like you're curious. One, so no, but like it. list off some things uh, you're good at. Talking. I'm not that good at talking. I have pretty decent diction. Your job, you, like, Re- requires like, it, yeah. Requires yes. you to be good at talking. I know. What do you mean? You're right. If you're not good at that, then, like, what are you... What am I doing? You gotta find a new career. <laughs> Zach Seng <Sengshel. laughs> Heather. <laughs> Dan. <laughs> B. Miller's here. Yeah, Woo! right on time. We start with B telling you to find a new yeah, career. Yeah, literally, this, this is going really well so far. I already told Zach that he needs a different job. It so. happens. It's going well. <laughs> it's all about constructive criticism, and I need this type of feedback from people, you know, who are in the industry and who have to sit down and talk to me. But, so. like, to be fair, you essentially just said that you're bad at talking. I, I did. <laughs> I, be, just because, you know, I could always be better at it. I right. think I, I think I'm better than most at talking, but I could be more clear, more concise, and yeah, I could, I could do use things cooler, differently. Bigger words, I could be a little more interesting and entertaining, I guess. But, but, uh, but like at the same time, who really cares? That's it. Who's like really listening to what I'm saying? It's like, oh, this girl's not using big enough words for me. But people do listen to what you say. Your fan fan base is really responsive to everything that happens, and like, oh, yeah, they, no, sure. dude, I loved seeing your Twitter poll the other day of you asking off of uh, chapter one, right? W- what was your favorite song? Did you gauge like single decision based on that? No, actually, I was just kind of trying to confirm that I made the correct single decision, and also, okay. like, I'm just curious. Like, I like to hear my fans' feedback because, obviously, like I want to like put out music that they will like obviously yeah. like I'm gonna write things that I like and think are cool but I don't want to release things that everyone else is like this sucks because then I can just keep it for myself and listen to it on my own in my car I'm like this is a good <laughs> song but nobody else cares about it but I just wanted to see like stylistically because all three of the songs melodically are very different obviously and even musically are very different and stylistically so I was kind of like what do they prefer like more of a ballady kind of thing yeah. or like more of like you know an upbeat, more R&B style kind of thing, like moodier or like more of like a song like you type of vibe. I was like, what's going on here? And song like you, I mean, it, it won in the poll. It, it validated your yes, decision. that validated my decision. Correct. Yeah. So uh, is the goal here, right? Because you're, you're releasing three different EPs and it, it's going to be three singles for each EP. They're all supposed to be released by November. Correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. Ha- yeah. Is the goal <laughs> to have like one standout record that's going to cut through off of every EP? Not necessarily for me. I mean, I don't know about everybody else. Like, everyone on my team might be, like, shaking their heads like, no, don't say that. You're wrong. (laughs) Um, But essentially, I wanted, so I'm releasing four sets of three songs. Okay. Um, So I'm releasing three songs every three months until November because we started in February. Got it. And I thought that that would be a cool way to keep people updated on what I'm doing because as a music listener, I don't like that I get 12 songs a year from somebody and that's I agree. that's it. And they they get I get them all at once and then they they're gone. Yeah. Because I feel like I I can't relate to that as much as I would be able to relate to them constantly putting out stuff because then I feel like I'm constantly being updated with what's going on in their lives and, and in their head. Are you updating the music from chapter to chapter? Like, do you know what's going to be in chapter two yet? Um, well, yeah, because that's coming. So that has to be like mastered and ready to go like soon. Like, okay. That's coming in May. So, so like that music three. is written. Uh, chapter three, we have two of the songs already picked, but we don't have a third one yet. I Got might it. find something from the past that I wrote that I think is still relevant or I might write something new. I'm not sure yet. Cool. Um, and we might actually switch out one of the other songs that's in there already. We're just kind of trying to outline it. Okay. Um, right now. Um, but I just thought that that would be a way cooler way to release music because... I mean, people are constantly getting new content, first of all. But second of all, like, they feel like they're, I feel like they probably think that they're more connected to me because I'm actually telling them what's going on all the time rather than just once. Yeah. No, I totally get that. And it's also the way, like, humans consume music, right? Like, you can release an album and, like, the shelf life of an album can only be, you know, two or three, maybe four months, right? Right. And then at that point, like, I I just, I blew my load. with a new one. Yeah. But now- Right when they start getting bored, I'm like, just kidding. You're not bored anymore. Exactly. That's the key. That got them. And then by the end of the year, I've accidentally tricked everyone into listening to my whole album. (laughs) Because, like, now it's so hard to get people to listen to your whole album. Right. 
nobody cares about albums anymore. Literally nobody cares. And it's really hard to be like, hey, listen to all 12 of these songs in one day all at once. But now in November, I'm like, ha ha, like I've actually tricked you into gotcha. listening to all of them. Like, like ha, got you. Some songs do go <laughs> undervalued on it. Like, I mean, there's the, the famous word, album filler, right? Like, it, yep. you know, if you consume songs like that, I mean, some pieces of art that you could think would really resonate with their, the audience of yours, you know, they can go undervalued or kind of like unrecognized in a sea right. of like 12 others. But if you only release three at once, People are more yeah. more likely to listen to three songs at once than 12, 12 songs at once. Beautiful. Is it a whole story top to bottom? Like this is... For sure. Like what is the so, story you're looking to tell? Well, for me personally, like, because I obviously want people to interpret the music however they need it to be, like, whatever they need it to mean, that's yeah. what I want it to mean for them. Um, but for me personally, like, and I think we've all experienced this, and if we haven't, like, we will. Like, I think this just happens in life to everybody. Um by the time that I was writing the music that that came out in chapter one and that is going to continue to come out in the next chapters, like when I was writing this stuff, I was going through kind of an experience where somebody that had been really important in my life for a very long time, I kind of made a recognition one day. The day that I wrote Song Like You, I made this recognition where I was like, we don't actually do anything positive for one another. Like this person that I really care about and it's going to be so hard for me to not have them in my life as much I need to actually not have them, even though it's going to suck, because we don't do anything positive. Like, we were really bad for each other, and it wasn't just, like, a one-sided thing where the other person was bad for me, but, like, we both just didn't... We It just wasn't working. It was not good. But and, if it was bad for you, why did you care about him? Or did you care about that person despite how toxic the relationship was? It was more just, like, we had known each other for so long uh -huh. that it was, like, we were so close as friends that it was so, it was, like, it was so hard to just make the decision that it was, like, oh, my God, this doesn't work the way that it used to. Yeah. And for a lot, I feel like for, in different, like, in family relationships and relationships with another person or in friendships and whatever, this happens to all of us where somebody that we've been close with suddenly, like, we both change or one of us changes. what Something happens and all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to admit that. Because you obviously care about that person and have for so long. So it kind of takes, like, the music lyrically um, from from top to bottom, if you listen through at the end of the year once all the music comes out, it's kind of taking you through the emotions that I was feeling at that time. And the first chapter, chapter one, is is it's blue and it's, it's kind of representative of, like, a sad feeling of, like, I've made this realization and it sucks and yeah. I'm sad and I feel lonely, I feel abandoned, I feel just not really very great about myself right now. Chapter two is red, which is more like the in-between stage of that where it's like, okay, I've figured out that this is a problem and I need to address the problem and it still sucks, but at least like I'm I'm trying to figure it out now. Yeah. And then chapter three is yellow and that's more like I'm better now and I've dealt with this problem and it doesn't mean that there's light at the end of the tunnel and that like everything is sunshine and rainbows because that's not how life works. Of course. But, like I've dealt with one problem and now I'm better prepared for the next kind of thing. Beautiful. So are all three songs written about the same person? Um, no, actually. So, I Can't Breathe was actually, I mean, obviously I was sad about, um, you know, what a song like you is about, and I was sad about this person, but I was also just going through a rough phase in life when I wrote that song to where I kind of was down on myself, and I was like, I don't really know what I'm doing with my life, and I don't know if my life individually has a purpose and it has any kind of meaning to anybody besides myself, and I was feeling really sad, and I was feeling really lonely, and just kind of lost, and I didn't really know what to do, and so I just wrote a song about it, because I know that everyone feels that way. There's yeah. no way that nobody in this room, there's no way that anybody in this room hasn't felt like that, essentially. is Like, we definitely all have times where we reflect on our life, and all of a sudden we're just like, what, what am I actually doing? <laughs> and obviously, a lot of times, there's no reason to think that, because then you look back on when you thought about that, and you're like, wait, I was actually accomplishing something, and everything was fine. But in the moment, sometimes, it's really hard to recognize that things are actually okay. Yeah. Um, so that was, I mean, that song wasn't really about a person, it was more about me, and there are definitely other songs that are about me and how I'm feeling internally that not only are on Chapter Blue, but are on, chap, you know, Red and Yellow and are coming out in the future, um, and even songs that I haven't written that I'm sure I'll write about other things, and I mean, obviously, as you're moving on from one, one situation, you're leaving be behind one person, you find new people, so then there are new people, like, in the next chapters, there are definitely songs about other people yeah. that are coming out, so it was just all inspired by one event, 
but kind of like what happened in my life from that event. Well, in the song, I Can't Breathe, you actually sound like extremely sad in the song. Yeah. When you went in to record it, were you that sad or do you have to like get yourself in that mindset? So a lot of times when you write a song, you record a scratch vocal that day. Like just you just record a not a great vocal and you're like, we'll come back to this later. A placeholder. Uh, yeah, it's like a placeholder. Exactly. And that day, um, I literally the vocals that are on I Can't Breathe, like on the actual release version. We literally set up a microphone in the middle of the room and played the music into, like, these crappy headphones. And I just sang, like, pretty much, that's pretty much, like, one or two takes, that song. It really just consists of, like, one or two vocal takes put together. And um, I realized that, like, when I listened back to that and they were, we were talking about re-recording the vocals, I realized there's no way I was ever going to top that. Because when I wrote that song that day, I was so feeling it that I didn't think I could ever go back and re-record it. So, like, on different songs that are happier, like, or angrier, or something, it's just, it's not, like, necessarily a sad song. It's easy to go back and channel that emotion again. But when you're really, really upset about something and, like, sad, genuinely, like, down, yeah. it's hard to, like, find that again and mm-hmm. capture it. So we just, we kept the, like, almost, they're essentially scratch vocals, and we just kept them. Who are you performing to when you're in the studio singing that song? Me, to myself. I'm really just singing things for myself because I... I'm essentially telling myself things that I need to hear. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm always waiting for somebody else to write a song that's going to help me to, like, lift me up. And I'm like, why don't I just write one for myself? <laughs> that's you know? it's really beautiful, actually. <laughs> no, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's literally your therapist, you know? Yeah. But, that's... like, not really. Because like, I could give myself advice and then not follow it. But Do you do time. that? Yeah. Like, I'll give other people advice. And I'm like, wow, that was actually good advice. Like, I hope they follow that. And then when it comes to myself, like, I can't figure out mm-hmm. what the hell I'm supposed to be doing <laughs> but, with my life. But has there been a moment, like, where you write something in a song and, like, y- you use it to maybe inspire you, to help you, or to yeah, give you advice? Yeah, that's definitely happened. Where, like, I don't even realize that I've figured out something and then I'm writing and, like, lyric, like I just write down a lyric and I'm like, wait, like, I didn't even realize that that's in the back of my brain and I already consciously was, a, like, a, like, I'm consciously yeah. aware of this now. That was something that was in my subconscious before. How are you writing? Like, what is your process? Like, how, how do you how do you handle it? Because you wrote every song in chapter one, and I'm assuming it's going to be the same for the rest of yeah. them, right? Yeah, I didn't want to keep releasing music that I didn't write, just because that didn't feel, like, super cool. Well, can so, you tell me that realization? Like, what was that realization like for you? Like, when did it click that music well, written was, by someone else I was, like, you? 14 and 15 when I was recording for my last album, Not an Apology, and... I don't think that at that point in time I was necessarily ready to, like, write songs that the public could hear. Because I was was younger and I was inexperienced and I was also kind of afraid that people wouldn't understand what I was talking about and that people would judge me for what I was saying because I was younger. So I just, I didn't, I was, like, not prepared for that. But then when I started doing interviews and singing these songs and I would hear my fans tell me about how meaningful these songs were to them and how, like, they've learned from what I'm telling them. I felt like a liar. Like, I, I mean, obviously, I would never record a song. If, if I didn't write it, I wouldn't record it if it didn't matter to me and if I didn't relate to it. But I almost felt guilty when people would tell me that these songs meant so much to them and they thanked me because I was like, all I did was sing them. Like, I didn't... I mean, I wrote, like, four, of, three or four of the songs on Not an Apology, but most of them I didn't write, and I felt guilty and I was like wait I want to tell you guys how I personally feel and I want to really connect with you so that when you thank me for things or when you relate to me you're actually relating to me and I was like I'm just gonna do it like it's I think really I can cool. do it so I just started writing and it happened to work out that's a yeah. level of like authenticity that you really don't find very often in artists right because a lot of artists are totally okay with letting other people write their yeah. songs and letting them be the vessel yeah you know to get it out there but right and some people like that's okay like some people that doesn't bother them but like it like hurt like I like I felt guilty all the time and I was and I was also frustrated because I had things that I wanted to say and I was like I want to be able to say these things like not only am I not already saying things that like not only do I feel guilty about this but I also just feel like kind of stuck in a box because I I have things to say and I just need to figure out how to formulate them type of thing are you afraid of people judging your music no not anymore I used I used to think that I would be when I wrote music and now it's more like I'm proud of my music. Like I'm I'm not afraid that people will judge it negatively. Like if people don't like my songs, whatever, like no skin they off don't your care nose. about you. Yeah. But if you do, then that's really cool. It's it's like I focus more on the fact that it can affect people in a positive way to hear things that I've written rather than on thing like rather than on focusing on people not liking what I say. Yeah. yeah. No, I totally get it. Yeah. Wow. When you're writing a song like Burning Bridges, where does that scream f- come from? Did you write that into it? What? The like eh. 
the loud scream that comes into the song like two yeah. or three times. Yeah. So that was actually the producer on that song. His name's Oak. He's a really, really rad guy. Like I try to do a lot of my songs with him because he's just brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we were writing that song, I originally just sang that lyric like, I can't help it that I need you. And then he sent us back the rough and he's like, here, like I've just been working on the song the past two days. Like here's what I've gotten so far. And he just did that. And I, uh, I thought it was so cool. That was his instinct, the like screaming part. He took what I had said that originally wasn't a scream. Originally, I just sang it normal, and he pitched it and made it sound like a scream. Oh, and I just cool. thought it was so rad that I was like, cool, we're going to leave this here. So that was just his uh, instinct. That's what I think is really cool about music is like if one person's better at lyrics, one person's better at melodies, and then one person's like a producer that's actually making the music, like the three of you or the four of you, however many in the room, like collaborate, and you all put in your you all like contribute what you're best out to the song and then collectively it becomes something it's a really beautiful amazing. thing yeah it's awesome and it's so cool and you have to go in without an ego right like you yeah. can't really go in to it i mean you explain to me how you go into a session um i mean it, it, in the beginning it was harder because i in the beginning of like this whole process where i was writing this music i didn't know anybody i didn't really know a lot of writers and producers because i had never written them written my music before so Uh it was hard in the beginning so I would kind of walk in introduce myself and like obviously if you want to write a song about yourself you have to tell the other people in the room what your story is in order for them to help you create that song so I feel like I was constantly telling people the same thing over and over again and then eventually you find your people like the, the like I wrote Burning Bridges with this girl named Steph Jones and she's not only an amazing writer and my favorite person to write lyrics with but also like one of my closest friends I would say cool and so I like I, you find your niche, like you find like your people, and so I found Steph and I found Oak, the producer of that song, and like then it gets to a point where you just walk in, and you all know each other, you already know what's going on exactly. in each other's lives because you've talked so many times and you've written so many times together, and then you kind of vibe it out. So like Oak will start to work on a track, and we'll be like, oh, that's cool, and like Steph and I will be sitting, and we'll be trying to like come up with melodies, and then if we find something that where it all clicks at one time, then we roll with that and we continue on that way. Cool. But but like sometimes I'll like come in with something I've already written, like lyrics I've already written, and be like, how do we turn this into a song? But uh, most of the time, it's just like you walk in, you talk about how, what you're feeling that day, and then everybody else like kind of helps you bring it to life. Whose idea was it to kind of sample London Bridges Falling Down in that, that was, song? That was actually Oak's idea because we were talking about Burning Bridges. That's what Steph and I like. were writing those lyrics, and he was like, I wonder if London Bridges is public domain. So here's the rule for that. Go. If the last person who wrote on a song has been dead for 70 years or more, kind of morbid, <laughs> then you then it's public domain and anybody can access that. So that song was written, I'm pretty sure, in like the 1700s, so we yeah. were totally fine. Obviously, those people are long dead. Dude. R.I.P. Um, <laughs> for you. But, yeah, you. yeah we're in like, your we're honor. Like, we were like, thank you. Like, we get to use this cool. Because who would expect a drop to be kind of a nursery rhyme melody? Yeah. And we were I like, that's no- a brilliant idea, Oak. Let's do it. It was perfect. And I had no idea it was coming in the song. And when I w- when it clicked, it made me so happy. Yeah, good. Yeah, it like, it, it was, makes me happy when I hear really that. Great I'm like, yeah, like, this is a cool idea. Thanks, Oak. Yeah. <laughs> in the chapter one promo that you posted online, like, I know you kind of hinted towards it, but you kind of crack a smile at the end. Is that like saying, you know what I'm talking about? What video? The what? Pr- the, like, re- you release like a promo video. Yeah. And at the very end, you like, you crack a oh, smile. Yeah. Is that pretty much saying like, hey, I got through these sad, depressing times. But like, yes, yeah, like it's a, it's like the depressing part is pretty much on its way out. I made it got, through. We made it through. We and, got it. And where are we at now? I mean, y- you're in a solid place? I, personally, like I'm stable right now for the most part. <laughs> I mean, obviously I have my bad days. So like I'm doing pretty good right now. I'm pretty happy. Like um, the, I definitely, I wrote these songs a while ago when I was actually like really sad and obviously when I sing them I still feel that and it reminds me of how actually grateful I am that I experienced those things because I mean that's why I did the colors because I'm doing blue red and yellow and then the final three songs which will be the completion of the album is going to be called something that that kind of um, symbolizes like all the colors coming together because like I think that like, from my perspective, blue is, like, a, more of a sadness and, mm-hmm. like, the sadder songs. Red is kind of, like, empowering. Like, you're kind of inspired and you're kind of, like, okay, like, I'm going to, like, yeah. you're frustrated, but you're, like, the frustration is kind of empowering you yeah. to move forward or something. And then yellow is, like, kind of a happier, lighter, like, okay, like, this is one weight off my shoulders type of thing. And those are three very different emotions. And at the same time, I feel like you need those three emotions to be the best version of yourself. Like, you have to experience things that suck and you have to experience things that are awesome and things that are confusing in order to be the the, the best version of yourself. Yes. And I thought that the, the colors were cool because 
um, you those are the primary colors, and you can create any color in using the entire spectrum using those three primary colors. Kind of saying that like you need these three colors to make all the other colors, and you're like you need these emotions to in make order your to, life. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks. That's really cool. Thanks. <laughs> did you did you think of that? Like yeah. that, was that you like yeah. becoming one with yourself one night? Well, I see music in color. Really? Yes. So those were the colors that I actually just happened to see when I heard those three songs specifically on each EP. And I was like, why don't I just roll with that and say like, because even if you don't see music in color, I feel like if we all associate the color blue with a sadness. Of for course. The most part. Society all, is linked to two We together. all can associate red and yellow with different emotions that mm. are similar. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like what you feel when you look at something that's yellow is probably similar to how I feel. And how we all feel, for the most part. Like, I feel like it's, like, a happier color. It's, like, sunshine. And, like, mm -hmm. it's a little bit bright. It's, like, a brighter, happier color, depending on, like, the actual hue. Yeah. But, you know what I mean? So I was, like, this is kind of a way to simplify such, like, a crazy idea. Can you explain to me how you see music in color? Like, that's... Like, it's it's hard to, like, actually explain, because I don't even really know. But, like, when I listen to music, it's, like, my like I can see certain colors, like, not physically with my eyes, obviously, but, like, in my in your brain. brain. Like, and I visualize colors in my brain. I visualize certain scenarios. Like, say, like, I'm visual. Oh, this is just an example. It doesn't mean this has actually happened. But, like, uh -huh. say, like, I'm listening to a song, and it reminds me of, like, like it brings out the color green. Like, maybe I'll see, like, a forest in my brain. Like, maybe I'll visualize. Like, I visualize things that are green, not just, like, my whole brain just turns yeah, green yeah, or yeah. something. But, like, I just see things that are that color, and, like, that's what I'm thinking about type of thing. It's very weird. It's that's... very hard to describe because I don't even really know what's happening. When did you realize that? Um... I mean, I've always just known that that was a thing. So obviously, I listen to music and that happens, but, but I didn't realize that that was there was like a name for that, and that not all that doesn't happen to everybody until like probably two years ago. Like I didn't realize that that was like an actual thing that only certain people ha have. Is there like a song that you remember like hearing for the first time and being like, "Wow, I'm seeing brown bark wood"? Why or something like that? You know the song "Wild Horses." What? Rolling Stones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wild Horses. Yeah. That was one of my favorite songs when I was a kid, and. I used to always just see, like, obviously you're talking about horses, whatever, but, like, I would see, like, rolling hills and, like, br lots of browns and, like, golden colors. Like, every time I hear that song, I still see those same colors. It's, like, a gold or a bronze. Or, like, it's, like, goldish and, like, kind of bronzy and, like, very, like, open and expansive. And, like, I, that was the f that's the first song that I can look back and, like, say that, like, I can remember, like, f like seeing that and feeling that. Wow. But it's cool. It's so, like I don't even really know. Like I, it's very weird to actually describe because yeah. I don't necessarily know what it is. You did a good job. I get it. Yeah. You no, I to I totally understand it. <laughs> job well done. You're happy Thanks. that there's no more honeybees on Cheerio boxes? Um. Yeah. My mom actually texted me today though, and she was like. Um, B, um, Cheerios is owned by General Mills, and General Mills actually uses pesticides and all kinds of awful, terrible things that are actually <laughs> killing the bees to create their Cheerios, and the only way that they could actually help the bees is if they started going organic, and I was like, wow, mom, you're actually right. So, even though they're, <laughs> even though it's cool that they're, like, promoting helping the bees, they're not necessarily actually doing anything. It's cool that they're giving out seeds for, like, fancy to, marketing, to dude. wildflowers, but my mom was like, that's pretty much just marketing and not actually doing anything helpful so I was like wow mom way to burst the bubble <laughs> <laughs> how's your mom doing How, how's everybody doing everybody good yeah they're pretty good are they here with you in LA no my mom and my, my whole family is on the east coast so it's really hard like I'm really out here like totally alone like I have no family on the west coast like what? my uh, my extended family even is all on Long Island so like literally everyone is in New York and I'm here well, by myself. And how is that? Because you're only 19. 18. Hey, Jesus. Fetus. You know, you're... Come on! <laughs> Fetus. <laughs> you're navigating life. You mentioned that what? you're 18, not 19, but did you have to wait to put this... Is it an EP or is it a chapter? What are you calling it's a it? a chapter. Did you have to wait to put this out until you were 18 because there is an explicit logo on it? No, actually. That's a good question, though. But we were just... That was the timing that worked out okay. best for us. Because <clears throat> pretty much the entire music industry shuts down from, like the beginning of December through, like, the middle of January for, like, yeah. the holidays. So people, you if you notice, like, most, like, really nobody releases music during that time because mm -hmm. the be the beginning of, like, the musical year is in February. Charts are closed. Part. It's yeah. pretty useless if you decide to release yeah. then. pretty pointless. Yeah, but you're, you're here navigating Hollywood by yourself. By myself. My well, mom, I flew my, so I just got my own apartment, like, two weeks ago, three weeks ago maybe. Um, and I used to come out here all the time and just stay in hotels for like months at a time, which was awful. So yeah, I, I I'm a once. lot happier in my own place. What'd you say? Yeah, I said, yeah, I saw you once. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Don't even. <laughs> anyway, sorry, keep going. <laughs> Don't bring that up. Um, but yeah, so, um, 
I have my own place now, and, like, the first day that I, like, got my keys, I flew my mom out, and she, like, helped me, like, get my furniture set up. She helped me go shopping for all the essentials, like, toilet paper and, Beautiful. like, toothpaste and towels and cleaning supplies and all, and, like, And are you utensils. keeping things stocked? Yeah, because you don't, you don't realize how much you don't have until you until move out of your yes. parents' house. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. This has been my biggest dilemma. It's, like, a lot of my friends who live with their parents, so, like, they live in college, so they, like, have a roommate or something, uh-huh. like, I just realized the other day, like, I would actually starve if I didn't, like, feed myself. How weird is that? <laughs> yeah. Like, yes. being an adult is hard. Like, or if you yeah. didn't buy your own towels, like, you wouldn't not, have anything right, to dry your right, body with. Right, Like, Like, a lot of times, like, obviously when you live at home, like, you think about, like, you're actively thinking, like, oh, look, like, I need this and I need this and I need this. And, like, maybe you're about to go to the store and then your mom is like, oh, I'm about to run to the store. Do you need anything? And you're like, yes, I actually have a list prepared. Here are all these things I realized I needed. But now it's like... If I'm waiting around for my mom to be like, hey, like, about to run to the store. Like, that doesn't happen. No. Like, if I'm thinking about things I need, like, they're just going to continue to deplete until I have nothing left. And, I need to and then your list is so and big. And then my list is so big. And I go to the grocery store with, like, $400. And I'm like, help. Like, Being so many, an adult sucks. And the other day, someone pointed out that I had no toilet paper in my apartment. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> how can I invite people over and not have any toilet paper? This is I have cute. toilet paper now. <laughs> Buy in bulk. That's my only suggestion. Yeah, I, like, the last time I went to the grocery store... I bought like 12 rolls of toilet paper. Good. I mean, that, you know, so that should be depending on, you know, what your deal is, but that should be enough <laughs> to get you through for quite some time. Hopefully that'll last a while. Yeah. I don't know what. I don't want to be up I don't want to get too personal. But like, <laughs> Crying. Yeah. <laughs> <Good there. laughs> uh, so, are we, are we going to be open, you know, emotionally, mentally to possibly a new relationship? Yeah, for sure. Like, if, I'm not, I would never be opposed, like, if somebody amazing walked into my life, I wouldn't just be like, well, I'm not ready for this yeah. yet. Like, you're never really ready for anything until it happens. You're, amen. So if somebody awesome just walked into my life today, I'd be like, totally down. What's your big, your, your top three takeaways from the last relationship so you know how to maybe, you know, approach the next one differently? Top three things. Um, I would say I don't want to let, other people's emotions constantly dictate mine. Like, obviously, if people are down that you care about, you are going to feel that and you're going to try to help them. But at the same time, you can't let somebody else's problems dictate how you live your own life. Like, I spent too much time being very caught up in, like, using all of my emotional energy to put into someone who I really couldn't lift up because they were just down all the time. And, like, that's not good. Um... You have to be with someone who supports you and who, like, understands, like, you just have shit that you need to do sometimes. And, like, they can't always rely on you to be there at all times. And it doesn't—I also for a long time thought it made me a bad person if somebody needed me and I couldn't be there right away. You can't but think none that. of us But none of us can be. We all have jobs. We all have things that we need to do and take care of. It's like we can't always be there for people. Yeah. And that's sometimes hard for certain people to accept. So, obviously, that. And just to find somebody who, like— makes you genuinely happy and feel good about yourself and tries to lift you up as much as they can rather than trying to tear you down. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Pete like, Miller. Yeah. Has anyone ever told you your voice is like a young Amy Winehouse vibe to it? No, that's the biggest compliment I've ever, like the best compliment I've ever, Ex- that's my wow. fate. that's my queen, like that's my hero. That's Especially my on the beginning of Song Like You because I played it for Heather yesterday and I was like, is this weird for me to say? And she's like, oh no, it actually yeah. does. It does. You guys, that's so awesome. Thank Woo! you. First Dan insults you, yes, you know, and know. then he compliments now you. Now he's your favorite person. The- yeah, well. I mean, that's a read. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter one, Blue. It is B. Miller's first of four EPs that are out right now, yeah. and there are chapters to an entire story. Check them out. Do yourself a favor and do it, because all three songs on the EP are absolutely phenomenal. They're beautiful records. Thank you. And, uh, you know, you did an incredible job. And Julia Michaels, cool to work with? You like her? Yeah, no, she's she's uh, super rad. Cool. Super rad. And she was one of the only people that, like, wrote, like, an actual ballad with me, because a lot of times people are like, let's not write a ballad, because and then it can't be a single kind of thing, because that's really how everyone in the music industry thinks. Which is Especially so crazy. Music, which is crazy. Because a great ballad a could really times, cut through. Yeah, like, a lot of times that's the song that people end up caring about the most, but she was, like, totally, like, rolling with me and, like, helping me to channel kind of my emotions, so. Hell yeah. That was a great day. B. Miller, everybody. A quality yeah. conversation. I thank you oh, for yeah. hanging out. For sure. Thanks, guys.